heads up display. I'm going to hand over to Simon. Thank you very much. Hi, folks. Right, I actually get a few complaints from my family. Um, they don't actually see what I do very much. So can you say hi to them, please, and wave? Hello. And over here as well. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so my name is Simon Bennett. I'm the ZAP project lead, and I work for Mozilla um, from home most of the time. So um, I'm going to start this first question for you, because I like finding a little bit about my audience, first of all. And first is, what kind of background you are? So do we have any developers here? Show of hands. Good number of developers, excellent. QA, functional testers? Got one, excellent. Um, security, any security people? Thought might be a few. Um, consultants, managers, good range of people, excellent. Um, so who here has not heard of Zap before? A few people, right. So I'm not gonna be able to do a very um, big introduction to Zap, that's too much of a topic, but hopefully you'll get an idea of what it can do. I've got some slides that I'll go through quite quickly about that, but I haven't got a huge amount of time, so I'll go through that, those bits quickly. But first, last thing is, who here has used Zap? Oh, good number, excellent. And has anyone tried the HUD yet? Oh, star. Um, right, <clears throat> that wasn't a surprise. I don't expect many people to try it. So very quickly, I'll go through what Zap is. So it is a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. It's completely free and open source and will stay that way. It is the world's most popular free and open source um, web security tool. I know that because I've been saying it at conferences for many years and no one's contradicted me. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's true. Um, <laughs> so it is an OWASP flagship project. OWASP has loads of projects, um, but the flag flagship ones are the ones that are the most stable and ones that are most useful and re recommended when you're getting started with security. It is a community project. Um, we want people to get involved. We encourage people to get involved. Um, that's very important to us. Um, we've got millions of things to do. We've got far too many fun things to do than people we've got. So how can you use Zap? So it is, a, it is a Java application. It's available on Windows, Linux, Mac OS. We've got multiple Docker images. Um, the stable um, is the same as the, the um, stable release, which we haven't updated for over a year now, and we should get the next version out soon. We have a weekly release, so every Monday, there's a new weekly Zap release, and that's a Docker image there as well. And we have a live image as well. We've had people come onto our IRC channel on Mozilla and tell us about a problem. In some cases, we've been able to fix those and tell them right an hour later, once a um, live Docker image is built, it's fixed. Not for everything. I can't promise that, but you know, we can do it sometimes. It is suitable for beginners and security professionals. Uh, when I started, I started because I was a developer and I wanted to learn about web security. So I did kind of, I didn't have the cheek to say it was for security professionals. What I did was, the, the original tagline was um, security tool for developers. But then I had loads of um, security people come up to me in conferences and say, hey, we use it too. So we know that a lot of security, security people use it amongst with, along with other tools. Um, but we still want it to be very useful for beginners. And we've got both the desktop mode and daemon mode. So it will run headless. And you can use it manually in any stage in development. And it's ideal for automation. Um, we have the daemon mode. We've got a very powerful API, which hopefully I'll get a chance to show you very quickly. And a lot of people use it for automation. And this, is, this particular project, I can talk about it, but when it comes down to it, it's much better if you actually see it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch to the Zap um, desktop UI. Now, most of you aren't gonna be able to see that very well because um, it's a little bit small, but I'm not gonna do very much, but basically what you need to do when you're using Zap manually is you need to configure your browser to proxy through Zap and you need to trust the Zap root CA certificate. So Zap creates a root certificate just for you, and you've got to import that so you can intercept HTTPS communications. That's a bit of a pain, um, particularly for me. I don't like doing it. So we've got this little option here, launching browsers, and basically what will happen is it will launch the browser of your choice, and it will configure it to proxy through Zap, and it will be configured to ignore certificate warnings. So great. We can now, so we have um, Bodget Store is a very simple, vulnerable app I wrote years ago. And what we'll see is if you go back to Zap, which you, you can see all the requests. So you can, you can see the requests, responses, what well, this hierarchy um, of the sites, what the actual the hierarchy of the site looks like. And you will be able to see there's some alerts down here. So basically, got some alerts here, including this one here. So we can tell just, but then what we're doing is we're passively scanning everything that goes through Zap. 
So what we know is that you know, we can find certain problems, like in this case, um, there's no X-Frame options header, which means the site is vulnerable to clickjacking. We don't have to do anything special. We can just look and see that. So just by proxying your browser through Zap to your application, Zap will be able to tell you some interesting things like that. Um, you can also do fun things. So you might find that your particular application, so here, there's a limit to the number of things you can put in your basket, which is a shame. Um, so what you can do is you can go back to Zap, you can set the breakpoint, switch back to the browser, do your operation, and then we can see the request here and we can change it and we can put a load more stuff in and submit that request. And then we've got loads more in there which we weren't supposed to be able to do. So we can do fun things like that. Um, but problem is, if you have a look at this, you know, the interface is quite, there's quite a few tabs down here. And actually, if you click on here, you'll see there's actually a load more we don't show um, by default. They come up here when you need or you can ask for them. And if you right click anywhere, there are loads of context sensitive um, options. That's because Zap is really powerful, very powerful tool. But the problem with that is um, what it means is for beginners, it's a bit overwhelming. They look at it and go, ah, yeah, it's quite scary. Um, what do we do? And um, that's difficult. But there's another problem, and that's with security professionals. Because I have this theory that sometimes security professionals, pen testers, spend too long in their security tools, which seems bizarre from somebody coming from somebody who writes a security tool. What I mean by that is some of the most fun vulnerabilities you can find are to do with the application, the application logic. And you've got to get under the skin of the application. You've got to really understand the application. And if you delve, go too deep into your security tool first, then you might not understand the application and see how you can abuse it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be using your security tools. They are essential, they're very important. But sometimes you need to start with the application and kind of get understand how the application fits together and how it works before you delve in. So we've got these two separate problems. They sound dif different, different, but if actually we thought, thought they were kind of similar. And what we want to do is we came up with a solution which is very much based on the kind of the idea of the fighter pilots. Fighter pilots have all these amazing controls in front of them. Um, and they could stare down them all the time. They don't, by all accounts. I'm not a fighter pilot. Um, but what they can do is they can look out of the cockpit, and all the essential information is projected onto the windscreen in the, in the way of a heads-up display or HUD. And that's what we wanted to do with Zap. We wanted to bring the security information into your field of vision, which is essentially the browser. So what we have is we have this little button here which um, enables a Zap HUD. And what I'll do is switch back to the browser. And if I just refresh that page, then all of a sudden, whoa, you know when the HUD's on. Um, this is splash screen. There is an option down there to actually um, turn it off again. But one thing I wanted to, uh, so you don't see it again, but one thing I want to point out is there's a link there to take the HUD tutor tutorial. And this is quite important because nobody reads manuals. Nobody does, honest. Um, and what we found is that you know, we get loads of questions and you know, they're in the documentation, but people don't see them. So what we've done is we've got this tutorial and it takes you through all the features of the HUD. And if you do have to tr try the HUD, and I hope you will, then please take the tutorial because it explains things I haven't got time to explain today. Um, and it's got some fun little tasks you've actually got to pass before you can get onto the next one. So it's, it's, you know, some, there's a lot of influence from mobile games and things like that in the HUD. So we've ripped that one off as well. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to continue to the target now. Can everyone at the back see this clear enough? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so what um, we've got is we now have the, this, these action, the HUD is these controls on the left and the right and the bottom. And what that's doing is kind of bringing information that you might find interesting. Um, so if we have a look here, what we've got is we have the alerts. And these are the alerts on this specific page. So we've got a medium level alert, and we click on that, and we see it's X-Frame Options header, not set. What a surprise. Um, and you can click on there, and you can get more information. So you can actually see all the information. You've got links to references, and you can go and see the request and response. And you can see that the X-Frame op Options header is not there. On the right-hand side, we have similar information, but for the site. So on the left, it's very much specific stuff. So this particular page, you want to focus on that. And on the right-hand side, it's for the site as a whole. Um, and particularly, that's very useful for something like JavaScript pages, which you won't actually view, you know, you won't look at those pages that have to be included. So you'd never probably see the alerts on those. You'll see them on the site. 
Um, and we've got down here, so if I go to this another page, one thing you'll notice is, see down there in the bottom left, there's a little count, um, and it's going up. Um, and what that is, is we've got history down there, and as requests are made, you get a count. So you actually know that, well, something might be going on this page, you know, it might be doing um, XHR requests, and you can go down and you can actually see what those are. So you can see these and you can look at them. But basically what it's doing, it's telling you what's going on. Um, and that's kind of really useful. And so if I go to this page here, if I have a look on the I think bottom right hand corner, at some point, if I'm lucky, I've got the time right, there you go. So there's some growl alerts that appear there. And the idea is, whenever the, a new type of vulnerability is found, there'll be a growl alert and it'll stack up. Once you've seen one alert for one particular, um, one growl alert for one particular alert, then you won't see any more, you've seen that. Um, but just to kind of let you know that something's been found. And one thing down here is this tool here. It's got a two on it. And what that's telling me is there are two hidden fields. And if you click on it, it shows you the hidden fields and makes them visible and you can edit them. Uh, so, and this is kind of interesting because what we've got here, we've actually got a separate zap domain with all the HUD controls on, but we're actually running code on the target domain. So all of a sudden we've got your security tool running on its own domain in the browser and it's running on the target domain as well. And if you can't think of any interesting things to do with that, then you're really not trying hard enough. Um, so, and one of the other things, remember that where I went into and had to switch between the browser and do all this stuff to make some changes? So I'm just gonna go here and I wanna change that. So I'm gonna put the breakpoint on here. I'm gonna submit and there is the request right in the browser. And I don't want that. I want to put in minus one million and, oops. And I didn't mean to do that because that's gonna trap on. So that was a mistake, sorry. Um, basically, you can now get money from the shop. And the whole idea is all of this stuff you can do in the browser. And you can do things like spidering. So we have the Zap Spider, which basically allows you to crawl the website and you can kick that off from the HUD. So we're gonna start it and you see there, the spider's progressing and at some point you'll probably see a whole load of um, new alerts that it's found just because it's spidering the site. I so said we got the history tab here so you can see all the requests we made. We also have the sites tree. So go to the sites tree and you can see all this stuff and you can see that actually we found a whole load of stuff under this particular domain. And you can also do, you can do active scanning as well. Now active scanning is the stuff where we're doing the dangerous stuff, we're actually attacking the application. Um, you can kick off an active scan across the whole site. That'll take a bit too long, so I'm not gonna do that. So what I'm gonna do is, we've got another option. Uh, we've got various options this, but I'm gonna just do a simple search and go down to the history, and we can find that request. And we can actually just active scan an individual request. And you'll see there, we found a cross-site scripting vulnerability. If you, have to, if you have time to click on those things, they'll come up. I didn't, so we'll just go here, and we can see the details. So basically, we can actually see all the information about cross-site scripting, how to solve it, and you got a link to the request, so you can see the request and response. We can run that, um, we can run that quest again in this console, or we can replay it in the browser. And kind of looks like a cross-site scripting vulnerability to me. Um, and what we can do is quite fun when you go back to the search page, we try and make it really obvious there's a problem here. So, we will highlight anything that is you really need to know about, and if you hover over that, you'll see cross-site scripting, and click on it, you'll then bring up this information. So what we're doing is we're bringing all this information from the security tool into your browser, uh, and it's up to you whether you want to look at it or not. It's just, it's there, it's something that can, you know, it's on your periphery, and if you want to dive, delve into it, then you've got that option. So, what I want to do is give you a very quick idea of how the HUD works because I think it's interesting and, and some of you developers and some security people might be interested in this as well. So what you typically do with browser, your browser makes the request, it goes through Zap, goes to the service, comes all the way back. Um, that's just standard. What we're doing now is we're actually injecting a page into your target application. And this is 
Um, this is actually on the target domain, and we can do that because we're, we're consensual, consensual man in the middle in you, and we can do stuff like that. Um, so what that does, that then actually includes extra frames, um, and so these ones are on as a separate DAP domain, and the other one is on the um, target site. We have a main display that kind of appears when, you, when necessary, and ground alerts, these are on the Zap domain. We have a service worker, and that uses WebSockets to talk to Zap, and we then use post messages both between the Zap um, frames and the target site, although obviously we don't really trust the target site, so there's a lot of uh, validation there. We also use IndexedDB uh, for storing stuff. It might look like we're trying to use every HTML5 um, technology under the sun, and we are, uh, but it's fun, but it's also, these have proved to be the things that actually work well. Um, but because of this, we support all main browsers, um, i.e. Firefox and Chrome. Nothing else will work, sorry. Um, if the others catch up, then fine, but uh, and we're, we're still having, we're using things which are kind of bleeding edge and differ in the browsers, so it's, it's challenging sometimes. I want to say, um, how safe is the HUD? Can it break your apps? Um, it can. We try to make sure it touches them as little as possible, but it's possible. If it does, let us know. Um, but you don't have to use it, so it's not the be-all and end-all. Can apps break it? Yes. If you're a JavaScript developer, it's trivial to put something in there that will break the HUD. Um, however, of course, what anything that's done on the server side or gets sent through to the browser, Zap is in the way before you actually it gets to your browser. So anything that that's done to try and break the HUD, you can actually undo in Zap on the way back, and then it just becomes an arms race. Um, I'm kind of hoping that developers will want to spend more time making their apps secure rather than break security tools, but some of them will, we know that. And the other thing is, can your apps attack you via the HUD? And that is theoretically possible. Um, we, we're really trying to take the security of the HUD very seriously, um, but it is part, we do have a bug bounty program, and we pay out for RCEs, and we have paid out $1,000 recently to a sec security re researcher on the HUD. Um, so go and hack it. Um, some of the future plans, we do need more testing stability. WebSocket display and manipulation, you might have noticed there's actually a WebSocket tab there. That does actually work. Um, but it's not committed yet. I'm just playing around with it on the way home. Uh, um, the other fun thing is browser event display and manipulation. Um, we had a student last year working on getting the events from the browser. So what we can actually do, and he's got a pull request in where we can show um, anything that's written to local storage. You'll get alerts. Um, so you can actually see what's going on. On the, And again, you'll get a, a counter of the number of times local storage is written to and you go in, you'll be able to look at it, change it. And we're looking at getting all the other, or well, any other relevant br um, browser events into the HUD as well. Um, and we want to expose more Zap features, but the idea is not to replace the Zap desktop, it's something different, so we don't want to overload it, and we want to see what the feedback is. So we really want to get feedback to pe from people to see how you use it and what you want from it. Some caveats, it's still early, early days. I wouldn't use it with potentially malicious sites. That's, you know, so, uh, but it is included in the Zap bug bounty program. So if you do find something, if you can, if you can get access um, to the Zap API from remote site, that's it, we call that an RCE. So, you know, we'll pay out for that. And one thing, it does not have all the functionality you need for a full pen test. We know that. So you really do need to have something like um, the Zap desktop uh, behind when you want to delve into it. But Trouble is, I know some of you here aren't so familiar with the Zap desktop. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close that. I'm going to close Zap down. And uh, I've got time for this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off another tool. Um, don't know if any of you are familiar with this. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've got a simple project here, and uh, so how do you do this? So I'm going to turn intercept off because that's just bizarre, um, and we're listening on 8899, and then I've got another little script here which I'm going to run. And what this is doing is this is actually kicking Zap off uh, in daemon mode. Um, but it's also, we've got an option to launch Firefox as well, because otherwise it's too painful, um, for me anyway. So 
So <laughs> basically, we've got a HUD option on Zap now, and what that will do is that will actually launch Zap, and we'll, we'll launch Firefox, and you'll have the HUD available, and what we can do is we can then, you can play around with that, and if you go back to um, Burp, you'll see all the requests there. And of course, Zap is stripping out all of the HUD stuff that's happening on one side, so Burp will just be seeing the kind of raw requests that we're making as if the HUD wasn't there. So uh, that means you can use, you know, we want to actually work as well as possible with other tools. Uh, so to wrap up, <laughs> we're hoping that the HUD is a great way to start security and testing your applications. It's available right now in the weekly releases. It will be part of Zap 2.8. That's coming soon. I was hoping it would be released by Christmas. Um, we haven't quite managed it. We're all volunteers. It's diff you know, these things take time. Um, but contributors always work very welcome. We've got loads of fun things to do. And the HUD is actually very hackable in a good way. Um, previous conferences, when I've had a bit more time, I've actually created a new HUD tool in Zap um, and got it working on stage. So you can do that. And we've got a new HUD um, group, so if you want to get in touch. And I don't have HUD stickers with me because I've given them to the OWASP diet guys, and they are um, on table somewhere. And last question for you, who now is planning to try out the HUD? My work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Um, got some questions or not? Yeah, yeah, there are a few questions. Uh, oh, excellent. We'll on the screen. Um, uh, first of all, uh, if you want to look at the questions that were sent using Slider, do. So number one is, does Zap intercept WebSocket traffic as well? So what we're doing is, so Zap intercepts WebSocket traffic. We're there, WebSocket traffic. Um, so we're displaying it, um, and I probably haven't got time to do it, but we have actually, so you can actually get, oh, quickly, did I leave it open? Yep. That's why I didn't want to change the screen, so you can show it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No. So we have here Juice, Juice Shop, Shop, and hopefully if that's going to play... Ah, no, sorry, because I launched Zap from the... I launched Zap in a different way, I haven't got the WebSocket tab here. If I did have launched it the other way, it would show. So we do actually show all the WebSocket messages. We can't intercept and change them yet. I was hoping to get that working on the journey down. Didn't quite work out yet. Cool. But as always, right, contributions are welcome, so you can yep, help absolutely. Um, our Zap project and uh, help that functionality be implemented. Uh, next question is, uh, is the HUD inserted straight into the DOM? How do you make sure it doesn't break the web app? Uh, yeah, so it is in in injected into the DOM. It can potentially break it. Uh, we've we've um, done some basic testing with the top Alexia top 500 sites. They've all proved okay. Well, there's one site we couldn't load because it does some weird reloading stuff. Um, but it kind of depends on how the application works. But yes, it is possible it could break it. But so far in our testing, we haven't found that many problems. But it's possible in its early days. And we are kind of, this is bleeding edge. So we're not aware of anyone else doing this. Um, so we're finding out as we go. Right, and there was one more question which is kind of outside of HUD, but there's a question about Zap Spider, whether it can interact with sitemap.xml. Yeah, so that's one of the standard um, uh, URLs we request, and obviously we find it, then that all like, we just spider all of that as well. Yep. Yeah, sure, you want to take some questions from the audience? <laughs> yeah, so let's see if we can try this. So, any questions? Yeah, this is a throwable mic, so we're going to throw yeah. it. All right, cool, go. catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just the technique. Oh, there else was a microphone. Um, what's the difference between the session and the uh, list of URLs in uh, Zap? Right, because from as, as far as I understand, they're interchangeable. If you're basically kind of building a scan, whether it's an active scan specifically, you should be able to kind of load up the list of URLs within the URLs and then load them up through the API. But you can also do that through the uh, session, right? Load up the session, then we'll scan that. What's what's the difference? So the session is. It's kind of the Zap, it's, it's what Zap is doing. So there's a record of everything you've done with Zap. So you can save the session um, and then reload it, re reload it again and have a look at things. But basically, whenever you start, you will get a Zap session, whether you like it or not, because that's how we work. And you can start new sessions, you can save them, you can t um, take snapshots of them. That, but the session um, contains all of the URLs, all of the requests and everything you've done. Right, so the session contains a lot more stuff than the list of URLs. But yeah, it's actually, a, it's actually a database. So we use a database on disk 
um, and everything that you've done is in that database. But if I were to right click and export URLs from session, would I be able to effectively replay? Would it kind of substitute a session? Uh, that's the, the URLs is a very um, limited amount of data that we've got. So, so in terms of targets, just in terms of the targets, yeah. then the scan will then be targeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. There's one more question. Uh, it seems Zap is very useful if run in daemon mode. Have you considered doing like Zap as a service, so I don't have to install anything? Just go to a website and like. Scan yeah, um, other website. We did have a plan for that um, some time ago. Um, somebody is kind of working on it a little bit. Trouble is, we there aren't many of us, and there's too much to do. Um, so we did, you know, we've we've got plans. We know exactly how we would do that, um, but too much time and not enough people. Sorry, I'd love Java, to do it. Any Java developers here <laughs> that would like to contribute? Very good. Very good. All right. Okay, uh, I think we're out of time. So, yep, Simon, no. thank you very much uh, for coming down over thank from you. Manchester and presenting the talk. Right. <laughs> if, if you